Headwaters uh, Conservation Program uh, with American Rivers. I've had the good fortune of working with Julie on a number of projects in the uh, Walker River Basin, uh, the Carson River Basin, and uh, the Truckee River Basin now as well. And so I'll stop sharing this slide and I'll let Julie take over. Great. All right, just one second. And as Julie's getting ready, I will uh, call folks attention to the fact that we are recording our speakers today. So just be mindful of that as you're interacting. <laughs> All right. OK, John, can you see just my slide? Yep, that looks perfect. Thanks. All right, great. Um, OK, well, as John said, my name is Julie Fair. I'm the director of California Headwaters Conservation for American Rivers, and I'm happy to be here sharing with you guys today. So thanks for the invite. Um, I'll be presenting about meadow restoration and beaver in this year in Nevada. Um, to start a little bit about American Rivers, we're a national organization, um, an NGO nonprofit that's focused on river restoration and protection across the country. Um, we have a headquarters in Washington, D.C., and I work in our California regional office, which is um, stratified by geography. We have a Central Valley program and a Headwaters program. And within our Headwaters program, one of our primary sub programs is meadow restoration. So we work regionally throughout the state. All right, so I'm going to give a little bit of background about meadows generally because it seems like we have a pretty diverse audience. Um, so why meadows? And so if you're less familiar, you can think about meadows as the floodplains of the upper watershed. They have pretty similar characteristics in a lot of ways. Um, there are 18,000 meadows um, comprising 280,000 acres in the Sierra Nevada, and that's only about 2% of the overall landscape, but meadows have um, really significant benefits for watersheds, so that's why we've chosen to focus on them. Um, here is a diagram of what we would call a healthy meadow, um, and it's probably a bit hard to see some of the small text, but um, some of the characteristics are a sinuous channel and a channel that has a small geometry so that when peak flows come through the system, they can easily overtop the banks and spread and soak in um, across the meadow. And so that supports a shallow groundwater table, which in turn supports wet meadow species and riparian species that are really good at holding the soils in place. Um, and it also acts as a sponge soaking up water. All right, and so, so those healthy meadows provide a lot of benefits for the watershed um, and for species. They can store water. Um, they, so when peak flows come through, they slow down and spread and sink in, which replenishes groundwater and attenuates peak flows. And then those meadows can hold water into the late season, release it later in the year, which is important for California especially with climate change and predictions that less snow will be stored as, or less water will be snowed as snow um, under climate change. Um, and they also can clean water. Um, the wet meadow vegetation, including sedges and herbaceous um, species are really good at holding soils in place. So you have reduced erosion um, and also filtering of sediment and pollutants. They also provide critical habitat. Within the Sierra, they're biodiversity hotspots, and they, based on their saturated conditions and high plant, plant biodiversity, they are habitat for many rare and threatened species, including migratory birds, um, fish and amphibians like the Yosemite toad, um, the willow flycatcher, so pretty important habitat. Um, they also sequester carbon, they, are, they support organic soils that store carbon. Um, and although they're 2% of the landscape in the Sierra, they may hold as much as a third of the organic carbon. Um, and there's some research being done right now looking at GHG fluxes in meadows. Um, there's a hypothesis that restored meadows would be carbon sinks, whereas unrestored meadows may um, not be. So it's it's something that a group of researchers across the state are working on and hopefully those results will be out pretty soon. 
All right, and so based on those benefits, um, they're becoming more and more well documented and it's really elevated meadow restoration within the state. Um, they were incorporated into the 2014 California Water Action Plan, um, as well as AB 2480, which was a pretty cool piece that basically recognized the headwaters regions as a part of California's water infrastructure, um, making it eligible for that type of funding, and it specifically called out meadow restoration. But Although meadows are pretty great and provide a lot of benefits for the watershed, um, it's estimated that about 50% of them or about 140,000 acres are degraded. Um, and this really started around the turn of the century with historic land uses. Um, some of the primary ones were overgrazing. Um, and I have a picture of Hope Valley Meadow in the Upper West Carson. And that was a stopover on the Mormon Immigrant Trail and it it saw a lot of grazing, like hundreds and hundreds of sheep. So it was just really unregulated at that time and resulted in loss of vegetation and soil compaction that had legacy impacts for the meadow. There was also ditching often to intentionally dry out meadows so that they would be better for grazing, um, diversions, culverts, road construction, railroad grades, um, fire suppression has led to encroachment in many meadows, which in turn affects the hydrology, and then also beaver extirpation, which um, beaver basically can maintain meadow conditions. And so I think actually beaver extirpation was probably a larger impact in Sierra Meadows than maybe people realize. All right. So here's another diagram. This is of a impacted, degraded, unhealthy meadow. Um, and this is probably not earth shattering to anyone, but you lose the sinuosity and you have incision. So you've lost that shallow groundwater table and with it, the wet meadow vegetation that really holds the soils in place. Um, and it's a self-perpetuating self cycle, most cases without some kind of intervention because now the flows can't get out and spread across the meadow. So all of that energy continues down the channel and continues to erode and create deeper channels. So how do we restore meadows? Um, I put up some examples of different techniques. Um, the best to get us back to the conditions we want, address incision and reconnecting the channel with the floodplain. Um, in an ideal world, you can use fill to fully fill an incised channel. Um, there's an example in the upper le left hand corner um, of Holstead Meadow, which is in Sequoia National Park. Um, and it was successful, but it was really expensive. You have to import a lot of fill. You have to try to find fill that matches the native alluvium. So it's high disturbance and high cost, but can be a result in really great projects. Um, the Second technique I've listed is pond and plug, which is a way to basically try to address the system without having to import a bunch of fill. So instead you excavate fill from the channel itself and use that to create a series of berms, which then are used to bring the water table up. Um, and then typically you reconnect a older channel with a smaller geometry or create a smaller geometry channel that then becomes the main channel for the meadow system. And this has been done for a long time in the Sierra. This organization, Plumas Corporation, has been doing it for 20 years, a lot of it in the feather watershed. Um, and they've had a lot of success with reconnecting the floodplain. But in more recent years, folks have sort of started to shy away from it a little bit because of the pond habitat that's created and also kind of the durability is sometimes in question. If, if plugs breach, then it can make the system unstable again. So there's been a little bit of a, a paradigm shift um, recently towards different techniques. Um, I've also included riffle augmentation, which maybe folks are pretty familiar with, where you would basically build up riffles so that they're higher and help to bring the water table up. Um, there's also bank stabilization techniques, which again, wouldn't really get you at addressing the root issue of trying to reconnect the channel with the 
meadow surface, but they have been a good fit where you really don't want a lot of disturbance um, or where you have a system that's already beginning to recover based on reducing the stressors or if you have beaver um, that are helping restore the system. And the example I've included in that photo is from Hope Valley, which we worked on with the Humboldt Toyabe National Forest. And in this photo, it's showing some um, log barbs that we installed to push water away from a meander bend that was threatening to cut off. And if it had cut off, we would have lost three feet of profile grade. So it would have basically created instability upstream, which was a really healthy reach of the meadow. So sort of a preventative um, action that would allow more time for the system to recover because it also has a, a beaver population there that was helping. Um, and we also planted hundreds of willow to try to get those plants to start to stabilize the banks again and hold them in place. Um, and finally, we have beaver and um, techniques that mimic beaver, including beaver, beaver dam analogs. Um, and I've included a photo here. The premise there is just um, natural wood features that act as dams and a grade sediment and raise the water table behind them, whether it's done by beavers or done by people. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. Sorry. OK, I wanted to pause really quickly before I jump into Beaver and talk about Indian Valley, which was a project that American Rivers worked on with partners in the upper McCollumy watershed. Um, it was a pond and plug project that was implemented in 2012 that restored 1.2 miles of stream channel. And I wanted to bring this up just to kind of give an example of um, demonstrating the benefits of meadow restoration. At this site, we conducted streamflow monitoring upstream and downstream of the project, as well as groundwater monitoring. And we actually published the results of that monitoring in the Journal of American Water Resources Association. And there's a citation there if you want to check it out. Um, and it basically demonstrated that even though the project was built in 2012 um, and the drought started in 2013 and carried on for several years, uh, we were still able to show that restoration resulted in um, summer base flows being increased by 5 to 12 times, um, and also that groundwater levels rose at four to five sites near the stream channel. So it was a pretty cool piece of literature for meadow restoration. All right, so jumping into beaver. Um, so beaver and meadows, and maybe folks have familiarity with beaver or maybe not. Um, they impound, they build dams that impound water and retain sediment. So that's why they are important in the context of meadows. Um, when they're built in healthy meadows, they help maintain the characteristics, the desirable characteristics of meadows. Um, when you have an incised channel, they can help to restore it um, because of the aggradation behind the features and rapidly raising the water table, which can in turn affect the vegetation and the physical processes. Um, however, you know, the reason I included this schematic um, is that when you have a deeply incised channel, it's often challenging for beaver dams to persist because all of the pressure from the stream flow is directed straight at the dams rather than dissipating across the floodplain. And sometimes it can take quite a while with natural beaver dams to result in restoration. So I want to give a little bit of context about beaver in the Sierra um, because beaver could really do a lot of meadow restoration work for us, um, but the historical context somewhat prevents that. So um, starting with extirpation, as I mentioned in the 1900s, um, that was they were nearly extirpated throughout most of California. Um, it was based on the fur trade. In 1911, CDFW passed a California Department of Fish and Wildlife, CDFW, passed a law protecting beaver. They were noticing this was happening. In 1930, they revised that law to allow the killing of nuisance beaver when they created a threat to property, which is actually a very important issue, and I'm sure folks are aware of that. And that law stands today. In 1932 to 1950, CDFW began recognizing the benefits of beaver and developed a translocation program 
and there were a total of 1,200 beaver that were moved into watersheds across California, which helped establish the populations we see now. Um, so in 1942, there was a report by Donald Tapp, if I'm saying that correct, um, that basically stated that beaver were non-native in much of the Sierra, um, above a thousand feet in elevation on the western slope and nowhere on the eastern slope. And that was kind of a landmark piece and it influenced a lot of policy for several decades until 2012 when some researchers presented new evidence um, that beaver are native to both the high elevations of the western slope and the eastern slope. And now that is commonly accepted by experts, but policy and perceptions have been slower. Um, so a little bit about California beaver policy. In California, DFW manages beaver. Um, they're still classified as a detrimental species due to the threat to property where you have human beaver conflict. Um, the codes allow for depredation of nuisance beavers with a permit from DFW. Um, those codes do not allow anyone to possess them, transport them, or release them except for DFW. So the upshot of that is that no one can move them around the state except for DFW. Um, but you also can't remove a beaver dam without consulting with DFW. Um, so it's technically illegal to remove them without consultation. Um, and so DFW is the only one who can move them around and they don't currently have any kind of translocation program, at least that I'm aware of, um, versus Oregon and Washington, which in more recent years have updated their policies and either allowed others to move them around or have their own programs for doing so. And it's been successful with recolonization and helping with watershed restoration. Okay, so if we can't move beaver around, then one of our best options is to mimic them. Um, so we have these features called beaver dam analogs, as I mentioned, and they're, they've gained a lot of support in recent years because they are relatively low cost, low risk, and also uh, low disturbance um, versus some of these other techniques using fill. Um, if needed, they can be installed with only hand labor. Um, it can be done more quickly with equipment if your site allows for that. They're built with natural materials, just like wooden posts and willow primarily. So if they blow out, there's a low risk of downstream impacts. Um, even in systems that have native or natural beaver populations, sometimes they can be useful because they can help um, re-established conditions when you have an incised channel that would allow beaver to um, build dams that can persist. So you can, they're built a bit different than natural beaver dams, so you can build them a little bit beefier, pound the posts in deeper, build multiple of them in a series so that they provide redundancy for, the, for each other and try to help it along so that then the beaver can maintain the site over the long run. Um, but they are not necessarily a fit in all systems, as with most techniques. Um, stream power is a consideration, um, whether your dams are just going to be blown out. Sediment source is an important consideration, because if you don't have a good sediment source, you may not be getting the aggradation behind the dam that you would hope for, and you may not achieve restoration on a time scale that's appropriate. And then also dealing with perceptions there's still some issues about whether they're native or not, or if they're impounding water when you have a water right involved. So there's there's other considerations. Here's a couple examples of beaver dam analogs. The first one is from the Scott River watershed, and that's not necessarily in a meadow, but it is a really good example of how much aggradation you can get behind these types of features. Um, and then the other photo is demonstrating that there are different ways you can construct these features. Um, so you can kind of scale how impermeable they are um, based on your objectives. And if you did have any concerns about impounding water, you can construct them to be more permeable and allow more flow to go through. Um, versus if you want them to hold more water, more sediment, you can kind of pack them tighter with fill and straw and things. 
All right, here's an example of um, a project that American Rivers is involved with, with the Humboldt Toyabe National Forest, um, Faith Valley Meadow, which is in the upper West Fork Carson River. And there is a beaver population here, but we have incision um, in basically the lower two thirds of the meadow. So I don't know if you can see my pointer. Flow goes from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen and about the lower two thirds are incised by two to three feet. And so, and this map is showing monitoring of beaver dams that we've done. And what we see, we've done it in the spring and the fall. And what we see is that over the summer low flow period, they build many, many dams and then almost none of them persist through high flows. So we are planning to install probably 40 to 60 BDAs throughout the reach that would help reestablish conditions for the beaver there to maintain the site. And one of the primary objectives is to reestablish saturated conditions that willow flycatcher, um, which is a California endangered species, rely on for breeding. Um, we still have relic mature willows there, but they need the saturated conditions. All right. Um, so I'm just going to switch gears for just a second. I'm almost done. Um, so I just wanted to touch base on sort of the regional scale perspective of meadow restoration. As I mentioned, American Rivers works at the regional scale throughout the Sierra. Um, this map shows the extent of our projects. So we start in the Eagle Lake Pine Creek watershed in the north all the way down to Sequoia Park in the south. Um, we also developed a watershed scale assessment methodology um, for prioritizing sites. And we also work on regional partnership across the Sierra. So just to touch really briefly, um, the meadow condition scorecard is a rapid assessment that's really geared towards meadow restoration. Um, so it looks at the, it rapidly assesses a number of um, items related to meadow condition and is sort of the red, yellow, green of whether the site is a candidate for restoration. And it's helped us be more strategic about the sites that we want to pursue and basically get gives us a way to have really rapid um, data for sites where there may be no data currently. Um, we here on the in this map are the watersheds where we have done this assessment and the data is available on the UC Davis Meadows Clearinghouse. It's a really great resource in general if you're looking for things about meadows. There's a lot of project information as well as just a lot of literature. Um, and then at the regional scale, American Rivers is involved with coordination um, of multiple practitioners and we've been meeting as a group since probably 2013 or so, um, but formalized into the Sierra Meadows partnership in 2016. Um, and really the intention behind this group and then ultimately the Sierra Meadows strategy is to scale up restoration, knowing that so many meadows are degraded and that to have real watershed scale effects, we need to be doing more of it. So the intention behind the group and the Sierra Meadow strategy is to increase the pace, scale, and efficacy of meadow restoration throughout the Sierra Nevada. And this piece of strategy has really been important for elevating meadow restoration with the state, and it's now cited in um, grant programs, and it's just helped really put it on the map a little bit more. Um, and if you want more information about this group or the strategy, you can visit that website below. And that is it. Um, and here's, I'll leave you with this beautiful photo of a pretty large beaver dam in Faith Valley. And I think with that, we'll open it up to questions. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. So yeah. I, there was a question in the chat, and I think it may have been addressed. Um, Carrie Jensen asked, are beaver native to the Eastern Sierras? I've heard conflicting opinions. Um, I'll let Carrie either type in the chat or maybe jump on verbally and let us know if the information that you provided uh, got her what she needed. Great. While we're waiting for that, um, and, and while people are kind of chewing on what you presented and maybe coming up with their own questions, you know, 
Um, remember, you can pop a question into the chat, or if you want to raise your hand, uh, we'll call on you to, to ask your question out loud. Um, but I'll, I'll start off, Julie. Um, in terms of you know meadow, meadow restoration in, in the Sierras, what has been kind of the, the biggest hurdle or roadblock or most difficult uh, component of trying to complete meadow restoration that you've experienced? Um, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of a moving target, I would say, but um, one of the things that I personally have sort of bit off is um, permitting. And just, I think probably anyone that works on ecological permitting understands like how challenging it can be, especially when you're really trying to result in like ecological benefits. So a piece I didn't really cover very thoroughly because I think I was running out of time in my presentation is that within the Sierra Meadows partnership, we have broken ourselves into five work groups. And one of those is focused on regulatory improvement. So I'm the co-lead for that group. And we're really trying to basically engage sort of at the state level um, to see if we can streamline some of that. Um, this is like proportionately the amount of time you spend trying to get through permits and planning is just kind of crazy compared to the time and resources to actually implement the project. So I think that's the most significant hurdle. And Carrie did reply, said that uh, the paper you referenced answered her question. So that's awesome. Great. Uh, there was a question just popped in that says, have you been able to successfully collaborate with producers, uh, parentheses, i.e. ranchers and farms? We so we have we've we've had sort of limited experience with that. We, we've primarily worked with the Forest Service. We've have a couple projects with the Park Service, but we we've been trying to reach out to more um, ranchers and private landowners through land trusts. Um, but it's been a little bit of a tough nut to crack getting kind of like building the relationships with private landowners. But we do have one example of a project in the Merced watershed on the west side with um, the Sierra Foothill Conservancy that is an actively grazed site um, where we did restoration. We've well, never done a, a beaver project with a rancher though, so that that would be a bit new ter new territory for us. I'm guessing that with the number of NRCS folks online today, uh, that might be a good connection for you if you're interested in, in some of that. So I'll just uh, point out to those folks who are uh, with the NRCS, if, if you've got producers or landowners who may be interested in, in this sort of work, uh, Julie's email is, is right there on the screen. So go ahead and reach out to her. And if, if she's not the right person, I'm guessing that she'll uh, point to the the person that is with American Rivers. Absolutely, that sounds great. Yeah, we've been trying harder. We've, you know, we've kind of evolved that um, the scorecard process that I mentioned. Um, our most recent ones that we've done, we've really tried harder to reach out through any connections that we can for private lands. Um, but yeah, I'd appreciate any connections or any ideas. That'd be great. And then Jim Shepard shared a link there uh, to the, the low-tech process-based restoration resources uh, out of Utah State. So Jim, thanks for sharing that. And I, I believe that Julie has been uh, kind of in contact with some of those folks as well. Yes, I have. Um, I think there's sort of two groups that have been pushing um, like the BDAs and beaver restoration. And yeah, one is Joe Wheaton and the Utah State folks, and then also Michael Pollock with NOAA Fisheries, um, and we've been in contact with both of them. But there hasn't been a lot done in the Sierra until maybe the last couple, maybe like the last three years, I would say. So we're starting to kind of get some examples of this type of project in our geography, but it's somewhat new compared to some other areas. Excellent. Yeah, and I was thinking, Julie, if there are other resources that you may want to point people to um, after we finish with the Q&A, we can utilize the, the chat if you want to throw any additional uh, links in there for people to look at later on. Sure, and I know, John, we talked about whether or not I would share my slides, and 
we thought because it was being recorded, maybe not, but I feel fine about it. And then that way people could have access to the ones that are actually in the presentation, which might be useful. OK, yeah, um, if you want to share those with me after the fact, uh, we'll try to find a way to get that shared maybe through um, our website and then try to point people there. That way we don't miss people via email. Yeah, or I could even maybe copy and paste some of them into the chat now if people want. Um, or you can always email me later as well. OK. Last call for questions for Julie. Looks like. Looks like Michael's got a question here. Are there are any of the large scale meadow restoration projects still within active grazing allotment? How does that affect results of large scale projects? Um, let's see, so. I mostly can exp um, speak from my own experience, although there may be other examples in the broader partnership, but um, we've definitely done a few. Um, in the Walker watershed that John mentioned, we worked on three smaller projects and those are still being grazed. Um, often you just wanna fence them temporarily, and I'm sure the NRCS is well aware of that, just to let plants reestablish, but We've basically seen that restoration can be really compatible if done correctly with grazing. Um, and even the example I mentioned about bean meadow, um, grazing's actually been really useful for keeping down invasives there, um, especially as like the system is transitioning a bit. Um, and I guess, so let's see, how does that affect results of large scale projects? I'm not. I don't I don't have any personal experience with any really large projects that have grazing, so I'm, I might have to. Acknowledge that and or look for examples for you. <laughs> OK, thanks. Yeah, so uh, we're going to move on a little bit here. So Julie, if you want to stop sharing temporarily or well, <laughs> stop sharing your presentation and I'll ask Sonia to stop the recording. Uh, so folks know what we're hoping to do is do uh, a few smaller recordings today of the, the different speakers so that we can uh, share them later as, as discrete uh, segments rather than the whole thing all at once. John, did that work? Did which work? It's me stop me uh, ending my sharing. Yes, yes. Yeah, we're, we're back to the uh, the Hollywood Squares version here. Um, <laughs> 